Hi guys, so this is Shalini and I'm back to you with another video and today my topic is myasthenia gravis. So if you like the video and the content, kindly do like, share and subscribe and also let me know your valuable comments in the comment box. As an introduction, myasthenia gravis is an uncommon chronic disease of the neuromuscular junction in which an autoimmune process in most cases attacks the acetylcholine receptors at the postsynaptic muscle membrane. Few words I would like you to remember here is it is a disease of the neuromuscular junction and it attacks the acetylcholine receptor sites. It is characterized by varying degrees of weakness of voluntary muscles. Incidence Women are affected more than men and highest incident is in women at the age of 20 to 40 years of life and in men in 60 to 70 years of life. Etiological factors There are etiological factors which is unknown but there are certain thymic abnormalities which are common. Extrathymic tumors for example small cell carcinoma and also Hodgkin's disease hyperthyroidism which is present in 3 to 8 percentage of the cases. Various drugs may induce or exacerbate symptoms of myasthenia gravis. For example, certain antibiotics, trochanamide, magnesium, lithium, beta adrenergic receptor blocking agents, anticholinergics, penicillinamine, verampamil, quinidine, chloroquine, nitrofurantoin, vecuronium and certain cancer immunotherapy drugs. Before discussing the pathological changes that you would see in a neuron, in a patient with myasthenia gravis, I'd like to brief you about the anatomy of the neuron. So this is a neuron with the cell body and the dendrites, the nucleus, axon and the axon terminal. This is a clearer picture of the axon terminal. One individual axon terminal will supply or innovate into a single muscle fiber except in case of ocular muscles where multiple axon terminals will innovate or supply that particular area. So this is the presynaptic area, this is the terminal button, this is the synapse that you see and this is the postsynaptic area. In the presynaptic area you have vesicles filled with acetylcholine. One vesicle will contain 10,000 molecules of acetylcholine and these are the receptor sites the green color things that you see is the acetylcholine receptor. Into the trough you have acetylcholine esterase which will hydrolyze the excess acetylcholine that is coming here from the vesicles. In normal individual these are the nerve cell, these are the vesicle, vesicle containing acetylcholine. The acetylcholine is released which binds onto the receptor site. And once bound onto the receptor site, it causes muscle contraction. The excess acetylcholine is hydrolyzed by acetylcholine esterase. If excess acetylcholine enters the muscle fiber, it can cause fasciculations or spasm. And that is the reason it is hydrolyzed by acetylcholine esterase. In case of myasthenia gravis, what happens? The nerve cell has got vesicle which contains acetylcholine. This acetylcholine is released, but before it bounds onto the receptor site, there is already antibody sitting onto the receptor site which blocks the signal and that causes paralysis or varying degrees of muscle weakness. These antibodies are either anticholinergic receptor antibodies or there are other antibodies which is muscle specific tyrosine kinase or otherwise called as MUSC or low density lipoprotein receptor related to protein 4 otherwise called as LRP4. What is the relationship between thymoma and MG? There has been multiple times where I have seen thymoma patients and present to us with myasthenic symptoms. But there are on the contrary there are cases which have myasthenia gravis and do not have any thymic disease. To answer this question I have taken a study called as myasthenia gravis a study from India conducted by the Department of Neurology Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences. This was a retrospective study done among individuals affected with myasthenia gravis. I just want to highlight two important findings of this study. The peak age of onset for males was in the 6th and 7th decade and in females in the 3rd decade. Thymoma was common in males and hyperplasia in females. So I have few questions to ask you now. 
do all patients with mg have thymoma and on the other way do all patients with thymoma have mg now to answer these questions i'd like to quote the same study that i have quoted in the previous slide that is a study from the uh, neurology society of india so in this particular study that they have said is in the retrospective study they have said is they have found that 20, 10 to 20 percentage of the patients with mg have thymoma and 20 to 40 percentage of patients with thymoma have myasthenia gravis i'll tell you the mechanism a little later before that i wanted to understand one more concept which is paraneoplastic syndrome so in paraneoplastic syndrome what happens is there is a tumor sitting inside the body which will create uh, antibodies and which will trigger a immune response where abnormal antibodies are produced and these abnormal antibodies will try killing the normal cells so for example in case of thymoma or bronchogenic carcinoma specifically in thymoma what happens is so it is producing some kind of antibodies which is harmful which is abnormal and which will go and bind to the receptor site and can cause you okay can cause myasthenic symptoms so that is what happens so thymoma basically helps in what it helps in producing helper t cells so these helper t cells will help in producing b cells those b cells will produce antibodies and these antibodies if abnormal in nature can cause myasthenic symptoms now some other findings of the study was 75 percentage of the patients with myasthenia gravis had some kind of thymic disease of which 85 percentage had thymic hyperplasia and 10 to 15 percentage had thymoma so that is what i have told you in the first as the answer to the first question as well the clinical manifestation of myasthenia gravis to remember the clinical manifestation of myasthenia gravis is all that you have to remember is three words ocular extremity muscles and bulbar in my first slide i have told you that myasthenia gravis is a disease characterized by varying degrees of voluntary muscle weaknesses so in all of these condition what happens is in all of these cases what happens is there is varying degrees of muscle weakness now let's see one by one so there are there can be ocular symptoms like diplopia and ptosis ptosis is where you have drooping of the lids diplopia is where you have double vision bulbar weakness that is you have facial muscle weakness or weakness towards your neck and the face you'll have difficulty dysarthria is difficulty in speaking dysphagia is difficulty in swallowing dyspnea is difficulty in breathing so all that in your face and your neck the muscles are affected and you can present with these symptoms extremity weakness is you mostly these patients might show proximal weakness more than the distal weakness distal weakness is seen in gbs so proximal weakness is seen in usually in uh, mg or myasthenia gravis also neck weakness head drop so these are the manifestations that you will see in a patient who is affected with myasthenia gravis so this picture says you are now seeing through the eyes of someone who suffers with myasthenia gravis double vision is due to the weakening of the muscles that control eye movements so this is the picture which shows double vision there's something called as the osterman classification based on which we can classify individuals with myasthenia gravis so class 1 is where patients with present with ocular muscle weakness 2 3 and 4 there is no ocular muscle weakness in 2 3 and 4 predominantly it's a weakness of the bulbar muscle or weakness of limb and the spinal column so 2 is mild weakness 3 is moderate weakness and 4 is severe weakness class 5 is patients requiring intubation or with or without ventilation as part of diagnostic measures you have various tests the first one is adrophonium test in this test you inject a drug called as tencilon so once you in, uh, inject the drug the patient might experience increased power in the muscles so if he feels that, that then it is a positive adrophonium test which means you can confirm it as myasthenia gravis because tencilon what does it do it will inhibit the activity of acetylcholinesterase and they might feel increased power so that is adrophonium test you have blood analysis where you can find out whether the patient has got any musk antibodies or lrp4 antibodies or anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies this is just to find out that media sternal ct and mri is done to rule out if the patient has got any thymoma or any other tumor pft is also done to evaluate the 
uh, respiratory part of the patient like any respiratory weakness muscle weakness any problem in breathing difficulty in breathing it is done to evaluate that ice pack test i'll discuss in the next slide okay this is ice, ice pack test so this is a traditional uh, test which is done usually in resource poor settings where you can actually apply an ice pack over the eyes that has got ptosis so what will happen after two to three minutes is the patient will be able to open his eyes that means he is relieved of process for a for a few minutes so that is how again you can confirm of uh, myasthenia gravis because in case of cold regions or when you apply an ice pack you are inhibiting the activity of cholinesterase for some time so that is the reason that they are able to open their eyes so that is one way how you can diagnose myasthenia gravis so management Astral coldness stress inhibitors is what you have to do. The primary drug of choice is pyridostigmin and neostigmin. Immunosuppressive therapy is another way. Plasmapheresis to take away all the antibodies of the body and monoclonal antibodies. So these are the four uh, management measures that you can think of in a patient with myasthenia gravis. Surgical management in patients with myasthenia gravis is only when the patient has got some kind of a tumor in the mediastinal region like a thymoma. So you can think of thymectomy. Few words about myasthenic versus cholinergic crisis. Myasthenic crisis is where individuals have less of acetylcholine. Cholinergic crisis is on the contrary in individuals with more of acetylcholine. So what is the difference? An improvement in the muscle strength on injection of the drug will suggest myasthenic crisis. If there is no improvement and there is deterioration in the muscle strength, patient is probably in cholinergic crisis. So thank you. I hope that today's video was helpful for each of you. And if you have any doubts, clarifications and comments, please let me know in the comment box. Otherwise, thank you and have a great day.